welcome to Daily Debrief brought to you by People's Dispatch. I'm Pragya. Globally recognized activists, including Angela Davis, have kick-started a month-long campaign seeking political activist Mumia Abu Jamal's release from a U.S. prison where he has spent over 41 years. Activists remind that evidence in the case against him has repeatedly fallen apart. Next, the much-anticipated three-day visit of Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi to China concludes with the promise of a return visit. We look at the larger significance of this exchange today. And last, the earthquake in Syria and Turkey sparks serious new concerns in sanctions at Syria, where threats loom of a coming health emergency. One tank Black Panther Party member Mumia Abu Jamal's over 41 years in prison in the United States has prompted prominent global civil rights activists to kickstart a new campaign for his release. Abu Jamal was a young political activist in 1983 when he was convicted for killing a policeman. The evidence against him always seemed to be on shaky ground. Natalia from People's Dispatch joins us on this issue. Hi, Natalia. Thanks for joining us. Natalia, can you tell me what the campaign is all about? Yeah, so Mamiya Abu Jamal, um, he's a political prisoner in the U.S. He's been imprisoned for decades upon decades. Um, you know, he is a fighter for Black liberation, and a lot of political prisoners in the U.S. Um, are very similar. They're also fighters for Black liberation. Um, in a time when um, that sort of struggle was heavily repressed. I mean, even today, it's very heavily repressed. Um, and so people who, um, like Mumia Bujamal, like Rochelle McGee, like Matulu Shakur, were imprisoned, um, you know, in the previous century for um, struggling for um, Black freedom in the US. Um, and the FBI essentially targeted them, right? So. Right now, um, after decades upon decades of um, Mumia Abu-Jamal being in prison um, in Pennsylvania, um, new evidence has been discovered that appears to show that one of the key witnesses was paid for his testimony. Um, and also that um, there was racism involved in the jury selection. And so because of this new evidence, um, within the next month or so up until March 16th, the judge in Pennsylvania is going to um, decide on his case, um, you know, whether or not he could be free. Um, and, you know, many are overjoyed. Many of his supporters um, are very, very thrilled that um, this is possible. Um, this has been a very, very long struggle. You know, um, Mumia Abu-Jamal, um, former Black Panther, was originally charged with murdering a police officer, which in the U.S. Um, is a very, very, very high um, crime. I mean, um, people get the death penalty for this sort of thing. Um, Mumia did originally get the death penalty. There was a campaign to um, reduce his sentence to life in prison um, and free him. Eventually, they in the 90s, I believe, they did um, reduce his sentence to life in prison as a result of the struggle. Um, and ever since then, um, it's been a fight to release him from prison because his supporters argue that he did not kill this police officer, um, that the evidence is insufficient. And now with this new evidence coming in, it seems like um, they'll finally get a chance to prove this to be true in court um, and get a fair trial from Mumia. Right. Uh, you know, you said he's a political prisoner. Can you sort of describe why he's considered a political prisoner? Yeah, well, you know, the United States government, um, as we all know, likes to point fingers at other countries and say, oh, Russia, China, Cuba, they have political prisoners, they're um, oppressive governments. Um, but, you know, the United States also has prisoners that um, have been accused of other crimes, but are really in prison because they um, struggled politically on different issues, right? So um, Ana Belen Montes is an example um, of, I believe, a recently released political prisoner um, who um, was a spy for Cuba um, and was in prison for a very long time in the U.S., um, and, you know, I think the most notable examples of this are people who in the 60s and 70s um, fought for Black liberation um, 
in the Black Panther Party or other organizations. Um, so um, Mutulu Shakur, he um, was recently released with six months to live, but he had been in prison for a very long time. And he, you know, was accused also of, of something that he didn't commit. Um, he was a, he's a very famous um, health worker and acupuncturist. Um, Rochelle McGee, who was part of a raid in a US courthouse, um, who did not kill anyone, but he has been the longest serving political prisoner in the US, um, in prison for 60 plus years, I believe, um, for his involvement in that courthouse holdup, um, which was also an event that was heavily linked with the Black Panther Party um, and, again, the Black liberation struggle at the time. Um, and many, many more. Um, Julia Muntakim, also in this boat, someone who was released um, a few years ago, um, who I got to interview, um, who also struggled for Black liberation in the 60s and 70s. Um, so, you know, there's a there are quite a few political prisoners who are often, um, like Mumia Bujamal and Asad Shakur, accused of killing a police officer because that's um, a crime that you can get a very severe penalty for. Um, but there's very little to no evidence that he actually did, um, that Mumia actually did kill this police officer. But to this day, you know, the police um, hate him. I mean, the, the Fraternal Order of Police really makes a point to fight for Mumia to stay in prison for the rest of his life. Um, while his supporters are fighting for his release. Um, and so, yes, the U.S. Um, does not really admit that it has political prisoners, but there are many um, people in prison because the FBI targeted them while they were fighting for Black liberation in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and now they are in prison on charges of something that they did not commit or have been recently released um, after decades. Thanks a lot for joining us, Natalia. Yeah, no problem. Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi's three-day visit to China ended in numerous bilateral agreements, but the visit is most significant for its context and for what China and Iran emphasize the most, solidarity and cooperation beyond the shadow of the West and lifting these sanctions against Iran. Abdul from People's Dispatch has been following his visit. Abdul, thanks for joining us. So, Abdul, this visit was much anticipated. Can you tell us what the key points of their interaction was now that the visit is over? Well, uh, uh, Raisi visited uh, China for three days and uh, he met, apart from uh, President Xi Jinping, he also met other officials. And uh, both the countries have signed uh, more than a dozen of mutual bilateral agreements related to energy cooperation, finance, technology, and so on and so forth. There were also a, a joint statement. Uh, there was a joint statement at the end of the meeting, which basically talks about the common uh, perspective with which this particular visit was take, undertaken, uh, in which, uh, of course, apart from uh, uh, both the countries uh, giving a call for uh, the lifting of all the sanctions imposed on Iran since the U.S. unilateral withdrawal from the uh, nucle nuclear deal in 2018, uh, claiming that such kind of sanctions hamper the uh, global uh, agreements and uh, goes against uh, the, the, the international uh, principles uh, of cooperation and stability. Uh, apart from that, it also talks about um, how uh, both the countries will carry forward their future uh, uh, relations. In particular, uh, there is already a strategic uh, agreement between China and Iran signed in 2021 for 25 years. Uh, apart from that, uh, there was also a talk of uh, uh, China, there is prospect of Iran, sorry, joining BRICS plus uh, countries. China, uh, sorry, Iran is already a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So the, these are uh, there are me these are the major points. Apart from that, uh, of course, uh, Jing Xi Jinping also agreed to visit Iran in near future. Uh, there were uh, uh, agreements or a, kind of a common ground over the uh, uh, the the need of regional peace in uh, in in the Persian Gulf. Uh, 
as we all know there are there are uh, iran has certain issues with uh, the gulf countries there are issues with israel uh, uh, israel has tried to kind of uh, uh, take very various kinds of violent action against iranians so all those things have been mentioned directly or indirectly apart from that uh, uh, a very important point was also mentioned in the uh, uh, in in the agreement uh, sorry in the statement which talks about the uh, uh, iranian perspective kind of it seems china concurs that uh, uh, there is an attempt to uh, politicize international atomic uh, energy agency uh, by certain countries of course the names of those countries are not mentioned but it is a uh, common knowledge that uh, it is talking about the us and israel's push to basically uh, uh, to, uh, of i uh, of iaea to investigate certain issues about iran so uh, both the countries agree that this such attempts are basically uh, uh, not good for the uh, npt for the larger uh, uh, global uh, the the reputation of the iaea and such things need to be avoided so by, uh, in a nutshell this is what uh, uh, was the basic gist of a uh, three day visit of raisi to china Abdullah, tell us about what the implications are. I know that the Chinese side did say that it's a complex uh, global environment. So, what was that reference to, and what are the regional and international implications? Well, uh, that is a very important uh, uh, point of this visit. Uh, the joint statement talks about uh, uh, common uh, uh, commitment to multilateralism, and uh, it is uh, uh, again a common knowledge. that when uh, china and iran are talking about multilateralism they are basically trying to uh, uh, question the the hegemonic presence of one country in the global politics and that is the united states so uh, uh, th- as we have recently seen that there is a, a kind of a trilateral understanding emerging between china uh, iran and russia particularly uh, following the uh, the the war in ukraine and the uh, sanctions imposed on russia there is a west attempt to find a proxy war sorry fight a proxy war in ukraine against russia uh, and all these basically had led to uh, uh, coming of all these countries together sanctions against iran sanctions against russia and now uh, increased targeting of uh, chinese by the us uh, we have seen this uh, 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 ridiculous issue related to balloon, balloons being targeted um the 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 taiwan issue being raised there is a deliberate provocation as china thinks uh, on the issue by the us and then there are sanctions imposed on chinese tech companies and so on and so forth uh, uh, chinese uh, other co- uh, and other companies as well so uh, this basically has led to a larger uh, realignment in the global politics and iran uh, china and russia uh, seems to be coming together as a, a kind of a alternative pole to the unipolar us centered world politics and this visit basically confirms that particular uh, that particular realignment in the global politics uh, it also basically uh, uh, kind of addresses certain basic issues which were there between china and iran all this while for example uh, the three island issues in the persian gulf which became an issue when uh, xi jinping was in uh, saudi arabia uh, last year uh, that it seems that there is a uh, some kind of attempt to address that also and there is a push by the china uh, uh, that iran should uh, kind of create much more uh, favorable condition in the uh, larger west asia region it means mending uh, its relationship with saudi arabia and other uh, uh, arab countries so all these things basically lead to uh, 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 emergence of a, 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 a kind of a, a global uh, politics in which china uh, 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 along with iran and russia basically emerged uh, uh, as a, uh, as a group of countries which increasingly cooperate in global po- uh, forums on global forums uh, and kind of uh, try to create a much more uh, as they say Uh, just uh, an egalitarian global politics.
Right, Abdul, and thanks a lot for joining us with that update. Thousands are displaced, injured, and homeless in Syria after the 6 February earthquake. But there is a new crisis afoot as Western sanctions and years of armed conflict hamper relief. There are warnings of a cholera outbreak amid checkpoints and active discrimination in parts of Syria. We spoke to Anna Vreka from the People's Health Movement, who has been talking to health workers in Syria and Turkey. Anna, thank you for joining us. Uh, Anna, there were these reports which came uh, right after the earthquake, uh, very soon after the earthquake, where it was said that the sanctions are being lifted, etc., etc. But what is the real situation on the ground that you have been able to find out? So uh, essentially, what uh, what we are hearing from activists at, uh, on the ground uh, is that for now uh, only UN convoys are being able to enter Syria, while uh, the other uh, organizations, like for example the Kurdish Red, uh, Red Crescent uh, and, uh, and and other humanitarian organizations, are still experiencing problems in reaching the points which uh, they 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 are supposed to reach. So uh, some of these convoys are, are very very small convoys. Uh, they have been put together. Uh, in a very short time, with the idea of uh, making of you know uh, reinforcements coming up after them, uh, but at the moment it's still very unclear uh, how they're going to be able to pass, and uh, you know uh, it it depends a lot on how they are treated at the checkpoints uh, and what's the actual you know approach of the people at the checkpoints to to, to what they do. So uh, when it comes to, to Northwest Syria, it's definitely still, you know, what, uh, what is necessary uh, to actually address uh, the scale of, uh, of the experience that people have gone through recently. Right, Anna. Anna, can you just give a sort of idea of what people have told you about the health infrastructure, how it has been affected in Syria? There are long-term effects and also the immediate devastation of the earthquake. Can you give us a look at What's that? What's the situation there? Uh, yes, so uh, I think one of the most striking things that I've heard for now uh, is that, you know, uh, activists who have worked in, uh, especially in the north of the country, uh, have said that uh, while uh, the earthquake definitely did shake uh, the th things, uh, the health system was in such a bad shape from the beginning that, you know, it's very difficult to talk about uh, changes. So to begin with, the health system had a shortage and difficulties in accessing both medicines, both uh, health uh, health equipment, but also health workers. So essentially, the, uh, the situation there was so bad that uh, right now they're still uh, having trouble uh, in mapping things out. It's very unclear still. Uh, it was a couple of days ago. Uh, so uh, activists from uh, and coordinators from the Kurdish Red Crescent said, uh, warned that you know they had troubles uh, in actually estimating the numbers of, for example, cholera cases that are uh, that are expected to go, to go up uh, after the earthquake, uh, both because there are not uh, enough uh, not enough health workers, but also because there are not enough uh, testing kits and other equipment that are needed to uh, to carry this through. Uh, but of course, you know, uh, if we look at the health system uh, itself, it's been under tremendous strain. And today we have seen news of uh, it being overwhelmed by people seeking uh, seeking care after the earthquake. Uh, it also has to be said that a lot of people, you know, um, they're still outside of the health system and it's still unclear how they're going to receive care in this context. Uh, here we're talking both about uh, people who are going through uh, mental distress, who are having mental health issues because of the earthquake. They're either in shock, uh, they're too scared to go home, they don't have a home to return to, which of course increases the, the danger uh, of, um, of both uh, contagious diseases, but also of, uh, of um, a falling quality of mental health, let's put it that way. Uh, and then a third group, which is at particular risk and which uh, which activists have warned about that uh, should receive particular care in, in the days to come, uh, are, uh, are children 
who are unaccompanied uh, unaccompanied at the moment and who have been moving after the uh, moving after the earthquake uh, so there's um, it's a it's a very difficult difficult time for the for the people in Syria and in the context where mm, essentially no functioning health system has been there uh, for years because of the sanctions because of the inaccessibility of uh, the materials that they need to to actually have a functioning health system uh, is re- is really terrible Right, Anna. And Anna, uh, we spoke just a while back and you said you also have an update from uh, Turkey. What what was it that you have found out? Uh, yes. So, of course, you know, Turkey, at least when it comes to how the, the Western uh, countries reacted, uh, got a lot more attention than Syria and um, organized relief was much easier and much quicker to move in. Uh, but as we have heard from the Turkish Medical Association, uh, the situation there uh, might also be very underreported from what we have been hearing from, from the mainstream. Uh, so um, the official numbers now have crossed 30,000 of that. Uh, that's uh, in the for- uh, in in the areas hit by uh, hit by the earthquake. By, but the TMA warns that you know uh, essentially these earthquakes have essentially destroyed four major cities. Uh, so by the end of uh, of the rescue missions, by the end of uh, the the efforts to to uh, to save as many life- people as they can, uh, there are estimates going up to one one hundred thousand deaths uh, by the end of this process. So it's an incredible number. Uh, and what uh, what is also you know coming from from the act- activists in Turkey uh, is that. Since the government response was staggered, it was delayed uh, for for quite a bit of time. Uh, it was up to self-organizing of people and to essentially of how they managed to get volunteers in the areas hit and how they managed to organize, provide the provision of care there. Uh, the Turkish Medical Association uh, has sent its own volunteers uh, to the areas hit. I believe it was about 300 people from the TMA uh, who went there. Uh, in a situation where the TMA is actually uh, under, uh, you know, um, uh, under stress of its own because of the political process go- going against uh, the the organization, so uh, it still depends, you know, uh, to it still depends what's going to happen and how the response is going to pick up in the in the next days. Uh, but uh, it's um, it's a very large number of people who are who have been affected there and who are also. Uh, moving right now so uh, thousands of people on the move uh, which again makes it possible f- uh, makes it more likely that uh, the contagious diseases the communicable diseases that we have w- witnessed over the past year uh, might spread even more right anna sounds like a unfolding tragedy in both countries for a variety of reasons and thanks a lot for joining us with that update And that is all we have for you today. Thank you for watching Daily Debrief. Do come back to us tomorrow. You can find more such stories on our website, peoplesdispatch.org, and our regular updates on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.